I suppose I began uh, the Murdstone trilogy, and by the way, don't panic, it is only one volume, um, um, in a fit of spleen. Everybody was reading Harry Potter, and everybody was watching those interminable uh, Peter Jackson films, and I was a bit fed up. I was fed up that everybody was running around saying, find me the next Harry Potter, get me the next Harry Potter, I want some of that money. The people who wrote it made a hell of a lot more money than I did, and that was a bit, I was a bit cheesed off. So I started, I started rather bitterly imagining what it would be like to be somebody who could not write fantasy, who was bribed, seduced, bullied, desperate enough to, um, to attempt it. The story in the Murdstone trilogy is, is, is of my pathetic hero, Philip Murdstone, whose career is on the skids, is indeed bullied, seduced by his beautiful, hard-nosed agent, Minerva, to attempt a sword and sorcery fantasy, for which he's entirely unqualified. Like myself, he's phobic to everything Tolkien-esque. And to do so, he essentially sells his principles and his soul to a sort of Mephistelian, strange alien with whom he makes um, a, a Faustian deal. And from that point on, uh, Philip becomes um, enormously successful, but the two worlds, his and the world of the fantasy that he's created, start to kind of bleed into each other. I should say it's funny. It doesn't sound very funny the way I describe it, but um, I'm reliably informed it is quite hilarious. Allegedly, my first adult book, this is, with the Murdstone Trilogy, I deny it. I've always written adult books, really. It's just that um, I've been lumbered with this YA label, that stands for young adult, and I don't know what it means. Well, I do, it means nothing. YA means nothing at all. I never heard anybody call themselves a young adult. Teenagers call themselves teenagers. Nobody 17 or 18 ever called themselves a young adult. Really, the only difference between the Murdstone Trilogy and my previous books is that there are no teenagers. We do glimpse one with a spotty bum, that's true, and there is a an American teenage fantasy writer prodigy called Virgil Peroni, who makes a brief appearance. But otherwise, it's a teenage free zone. I belong to the sort of 60s generation where, you know, when I was at university, you were supposed to get stoned and read Lord of the Rings. And I could never achieve the second part of that contract, really. Tolkien, he's such a humorless old trouser cough of a writer, isn't he, really? I mean, there's no jokes, ponderous, you know, teacherly sort of donish old rubbish. I'm going to make enemies, aren't I? You know, once you've got magic powers and, a, and, a, and an amulet and a magic sword that does stuff, I mean, it's all a bit easy, isn't it, really? I don't know, it sort of struck me as a bit cheaty, really. OK, um, by way of apologise, for that um, gratuitous rant, I should say that I kind of, I, I kind of Murdstoned my myself in this book. I realised, you see, that if I had to, if if Philip Murdstone was to become hugely successful millionaire uh, writer of fantasy, in order for that to be convincing, I would have to offer the reader that fantasy. Otherwise, well, yeah. I thought. Um, my lord, I've trapped myself. I've stumbled into my own trap. And so I had to actually enter, I had to take my head into the world of sword and sorcery fantasy. Do you know the really shameful thing is I kind of enjoyed it. I got quite into it, really. Beards and pointy hats and dragons and all of it, really. I had good fun, actually. So, uh, in, so in the end, the, 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 um, the novel turned out to be far less ill-tempered and curmudgeonly and splenetic than I intended to be. I like to think this book is a, a sort of mongrel that wanders around pissing on every lamppost it comes against, really, and that includes um, publishers and agents and filmmakers and literary festivals and writers and basically anything that crossed my line of sight, really. But fun, fun with a kind of dark chocolate flavouring to it. But I love librarians, really. And I do love Tanya from Tavistock. Actually, I do, I, do, I do love this particular publisher of having David Fickling for being brave enough to publish this rather uncategorizable um, farrago of stuff. When I meet people who, who don't write, or, you know, um, what um, Naomi Campbell would have called civilians, <laughs> um, they say, oh, you write for a living. I say, yeah. He says, oh, that must be lovely. You must, that must be so nice. Just, you know, I've, I haven't actually performed grievous bodily harm on anybody saying that, you know. They want to be told, and teachers want you to say, particularly, that, that writing is a joy. You just scurry off to your study and, and, and words fall upon you like golden rain. 
It's probably an unfortunate metaphor, that one. Words fall upon you and you, you, you just transliterate them and, and there they are and it's wonderful. And then you, then you go and play squash with Martin Amis or something. And then you go down the wine bar. Um, but in fact, I find it a complete bloody slog. Most, most days of my life, I go up to the study with, with very reluctant knees and dread. And it takes me a good hour to kind of persuade myself that I'm not a complete failure. But that doesn't go down too well in schools. It's not considered inspirational. So, of course, writing is an unmitigated joy. Nice. Cool, that's great stuff. It was just how writing is an unmitigated joy. That's it. <laughs> 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 I know. They will be. <laughs> there will be fights in the playground if I come on. <laughs> Do I have to say it's me? <laughs> Prince Charles, yeah? Um, <laughs> okay. Philip returned to Downside and, at the fourth attempt, persuaded his knackered and knock-kneed Ford Siesta to start. Half an hour later, he arrived at Tavistock Library. Here, too, he was a familiar face. In addition to his net-surfing visits, he had given a good number of readings here. The last at which he'd raised the possibility of being paid had been almost a year earlier. In answer to his query, Tanya, her name was on a badge which rested on the gentle declension of her left breast, said, Well, gosh, it depends what you mean by fantasy. I mean, it's a broad-spectrum genre, as I'm sure you know. It's post-Tolkien traditionalist fantasy, of obviously. That's your goblins and wizards and so forth. Reliable. And then there's post-Tolkien experimental, which has glam rock angels and drugs and that sort of thing. Not to be confused, of course, with Mormon vampire fantasy, which is an entirely different thing, as is steampunk. Steampunk? You know, a uh, Victorian time warp like Blade Runner, directed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Ah, uh, yes. Philip's brain scrambled for coordinates like a drowning spider clutching at the radials of a plug hole. Then, of course, there's portal fantasy, in which the, gen the central characters find their way through some gap or tunnel in the cosmic fabric and find themselves in a different dimension of the spatio-temporal continuum. Although, in my opinion, and here Tanya sniffed disdainfully, these are often just sexed-up historical novels, although very popular with children of single parents, though I have absolutely no idea why. Let's see. Oh, yes, post-apocalypse fantasy, that's boy stuff. Experimental post-Tolkien with continuous violence. Think computer games for the semi-literate. Tricky to tell the difference between that and splatter SF, as often as not. It's provoked some very lively discussions as to cataloguing, I can tell you. Baguettes have been thrown in the staff room more than once. Dystopian fantasy is more or less the same thing, but with a girl as the main character, because teenage girls are more miserable than teenage boys. And what else? Philip Pullman. He's another problem. The Dewey system just wasn't designed with him in mind. Religious fantasy, you might say, but that's the same as theology, isn't it? Irene over there at the desk would call it pretentious fantasy, but then she only likes books about the SAS. There's Terry Pratchett, of course, but he's pretty sui generis. Indeed, Philip said, knowledgeably. And needless to say, there's Harry Potter, but you'll know those. No point you looking for them anyway, they're all out in reserve for the next two years. In fact, the books that J.K. says she's not going to write are reserved for the next two years. She looked at her watch. Probably best just to have a browse. You've got about 20 minutes before the next lot of kids from the community college come in for their library project. If you need help, I'll be in the security room checking the pepper sprays and the dogs. Use the wall phone to the right of the door. The code is 1984. She turned away and then turned back. The ones with the blue jackets tend to be better than the others, she said. Yes, this is my... I have got a New Zealand amulet, indeed. This, this, this wards off Tolkien fans. <laughs>